Hey, Jordan. Hi, Nicole. I feel like we've already had our conversation because we've been chatting backstage, but uh, I'm happy to start fresh from the beginning. Um, when I talked to you about uh, how long I've uh, have known you. I went through your career from the beginning of FASA to uh, to current harebrained schemes, and I think we worked out a little uh, timetable. So we're not going to bore anybody with um, too many uh, history details. But uh, but would you please uh, talk about a little bit about um, your start in in gaming, becoming a gamer? Uh, yeah, sure. So. Um uh, gaming was really important for me when I was a young kid. Um, I mean, I was that young, but I um, was a severe dyslexic and I uh, had uh, avoided learning to read. Um, uh, like a lot of dyslexics do, you can cheat your way around things. Uh, and I had successfully done that up until um, age 16 uh, when D&D uh, &D came out. Uh, and I was working at a summer camp um, only a couple hours away from um, uh, Lake Geneva, which was, you know, where um, uh, TSR was based, mm -hmm. and uh, so one of the one of the other counselors brought it to to camp and was our game master. And it's literally one of those moments where your your brain just goes and rewires, and it changed everything. I um, just loved the immersion, the socialization, the problem solving. Um, obviously, the story and narrative uh, just became completely absorbed in it, uh, and everybody was talking about, you know, elves and trolls and orcs, and I was like, what are those things? I don't know. I better figure out. And uh, Peter Jackson wasn't going to come along for, you know, a few decades. So, um, uh, so yeah, uh, both the D and D first edition rules and Tolkien were my kind of see Dick and Jane run books. Uh, and did you do you think that? Um the the social storytelling imaginative stuff um, hit it off with you because of your other things that you've been uh, your other skills that you've been applying when you had to kind of get around what you couldn't read in in words is that you know I, I never really thought about that but I think you're right because um, what a lot of dyslexics do is they learn to talk you become really good at BS because you are you don't know anything you're talking about because you couldn't read, so you, you BS all the time, and uh, that was a useful skill in game mastering. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> especially like even right away, we started um, uh, role playing. There was no rules; I didn't know any of the rules. But we would be sitting like I'd be in the lifeboat, and my friend would be, you know, uh, on the on the dock while we're out watching the kids swim, and we'd be role playing a story. You know, yeah. and just uh, just go yeah. back and forth, and and uh, to me that was enormously empowering. You know, and the reason camp was so important to me to begin with. Is because I didn't have to. I was a. I could be a different person at camp. At school, I'd like been held back grades and all that kind of stuff. I had all that kind of stigma. Yeah. At camp, I never had any of that. You know, so I could reinvent myself. Um, and so, on, uh, at some respect, you would think like the reading would be a threat, but it, it wasn't. You know, for some yeah. reason, it was part of that. You know, no, like that's great. Reinvention. It's inspirational, really. You know, to, to find something that that uh, takes something that's really hard and it, and it you you enjoyed it and loved it so much. That, um, that that isn't going to be a deterrence anymore. That thing that was a deterrent, it gives you the extra oomph to get through or whatever. Uh, um, I've thought about it because my, my daughter is a little dyslexic. It's not severe, but she um, definitely uh, learned to speak words that she couldn't recognize in print. And so her vocabulary was fantastic, and she relied on her memory a lot. She li relied on verbal storytelling. But then when she had to go like write it down, it was pared way down. It didn't have the the same uh, the, yeah, the richness, the, the yeah. same color, and the same the same yeah. excitement to it. So um, we, we, having that in common, I was I was curious if you saw that, and it seems like maybe you did. Well, yeah, absolutely, and, it, and uh, you know, especially for me, writing was always a challenge. I, l I learned to read, you know, um, by a lot of iteration, and my parents had provided tutoring when I was very young. I just was ignoring it because it was kind of, you know, physically painful. Um, so uh, learning to read, but writing was much harder because there was this thing called spelling. Yes. Um, and so I would, my 
papers would be very edited to the words I knew how to spell until yes. the wonderful invention of spell correcting, which yes. was then you know a liberation for me. That's great. Um, uh, one of the things that I've noticed about many of the projects that you've undertaken, going all the way back to the BattleTech pods, is that um, you have found a way to weave technology and technological advance into your your story base when you start. Um, was that intentional with? The, well, I've just been, like a personal interest. Yeah, always been an interest. Um, uh, you know, I'd, uh, before I could write uh, English, I could write code um, because it was much more confined mm -hmm. and the words were much simpler to spell. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had been uh, very interested in personal computers. Like my, the first one was an 8K PET, um, which I stood for 8K. <laughs> yeah, really, that's all the memory it had. Uh, and then saved up all my money and, and bought a 16K. Apple II uh, and started writing games on on that just for you know my own uh, enjoyment yeah. and my friends. Yeah. Uh, so computers were always very very interesting to me, and I always thought that there was a, a real uh, entertainment potential in them. Uh, and the BattleTech pods actually came about from uh, when I was at uh, the United States. My own, my very limited college career was at the United States Merchant Marine Academy, um, which is a, a government academy of the West Point or Annapolis kind of thing. Uh, and they had just built this $50 million bridge simulator uh, wow. for uh, training uh, pilots. Um, in the nautical sense, pilots are the people who take the big ships in and out of ports. Uh, and it's the most difficult part of, of uh, navigation because, you know, you can hit things out in the ocean, a lot less to hit. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so they, were, they just built this thing and it was, it was um, like big windows with really, really low, low polygon graphics and, and the different stages, um, stations of a bridge. And we didn't get to use it, but we got to tour it once. And I walked out of that room and said, well, that's the future of entertainment, right? We need to build those. And we go to, you know, planets and fantasy and, you know, not just, you know, New York. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, that, that's when I left the academy and said I was going to go home and make one of those, cool. which I failed at. Miserably, you know, tried yeah. to wire together a couple Apple IIs. That didn't work. Fried my Apple II. If I had kept, if I had not fried that motherboard, it was like it was like Apple II serial number like 500 and something. I would have been a collector's item. But no, oh. fried the motherboard, trying to serially connect it to another one to do multiple screens at the same time. So, but that, that vision stayed with me, and 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 actually was the reason why you started fast. I went out and tried to raise money to do that big kind of computer thing. Everybody's like, yeah, you're a college dropout. We have no idea what the freaking you're talking about. <laughs> and that doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I started FASA because um, I figured I'll be rich overnight and then could fund the, yeah. uh, the pods. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't work either. But seven years later, <laughs> um, we had enough money to, uh, to, to, to start committing financial suicide by trying to make the pods. <laughs> but we are, we are, we're, uh, we're touching on something that you already mentioned a little bit, which is um, that ability to reinvent yourself. You know, that, that experience, uh, role playing definitely gives you that opportunity. Um, playing games gives that opportunity. Um, but uh, it sounds like the, you've, do, you've just done it serially uh, for, for everything you've undertaken. You know? Yeah, are you saying I failed at everything I've tried, which is true. <laughs> um, I think, but I do. I think being able to reinvent yourself <laughs> is really good. I, I admire it. But I do think that, that games and role playing games. Um, are actually good training grounds to learn the concept of, of, of that failure is, is a tool for learning what to do next, right? Yeah. And that it isn't something that should, should shy you away and, and, and defeat you in a way that, that you stop trying. You know? yeah. uh, and certainly in any creative pursuit and, and any entrepreneurial pursuit, Many iterations are necessary, and many failures will will happen, bef you know, before success does. It's uh, it's so good to remind people of that because a lot of times they only see the end result of they miss all the hard work steps and all the all the failed starts that led up to the thing that you are known for and become successful with. Well, yeah, some people they, they say, "Oh, you're a serial entrepreneur," and I say, "Yeah, it's like a serial murderer. Only there's more corpses in my wake." <laughs> um, because, because you do, I mean, you, you know, uh, we, we, we talk about the business that succeed, but yeah. there were other businesses that didn't. And, yeah, and I was going to ask how you feel about being, I've, I've seen you referred to that way many times before, the, the serial entrepreneurship. And, and my, my sense is that you don't really identify that way. You don't identify yourself in the same way that people kind of um, uh, use it as a reverential um, descriptor of you and uh, you have much more um, 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I shouldn't be talking. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I think it's true that I, um, I don't. Uh, yeah, to me, the companies are not the. Uh, the, like some people start companies to start a company because they have an idea of how they're going to start a company. Yeah. I never did that yeah. um, because I'm really bad at running companies. Um, uh, the only reason I start companies is because I've had an idea for something that I think should be in the world. And uh, I'll look for other people to help me bring that in the world. And if no one else will, then I'll, I'll go start a company to do it um, because I get frustrated if things I think should be there aren't there. This is um, how I end up in trouble all the time. It's, <laughs> it's the oil. I guess I'll have to go do it myself then. And, exactly. Uh, and that's how I end up volunteering on things and, and helping, uh, you know, interview people on new startup uh, uh, programming. And, and uh, it, it leads to a lot of fun opportunities, for sure, to have that frustration driving you to go do it yourself and yeah. make it real. No, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, some of those ideas work and, and good companies come out of them and many of those ideas don't and they go away, you know. Um, and then you pick yourself up and try to learn from it. And, and try again. So you have uh, you have undertaken a lot of projects that required substantial financial capital. How did you um, you know work up to being confident enough to go for for those big things like you know selling my I wouldn't know how to sell my company to Microsoft if they wanted to buy me. I <laughs> um, I, I I don't have that kind of uh, assurance. And I know that it's because of, uh, you know, exposure and practice, and and I'm curious about your path there to be a guy who can, you know, you just sold another company <laughs> just like two weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, uh, yeah. That, yeah. That is true. Only a handful <laughs> of weeks ago. Uh, but um, I, you know, they don't start that way. I mean, we we I was talking about this with my son Nate because. Um, I was very fortunate in terms of in, in, no, in, in a number of things I was very fortunate, but one of them was kind of when I came into this industry, right? Um, uh, you know, at that point, uh, there just wasn't very high production. There wasn't very high costs That's to fair. barrier to entry. I mean, FASA started with a $600 investment, right? And I borrowed my half of that uh, from my parents. Yeah. And Ross actually brought my partner. He actually had the $300, which is how we ended up being partners. I was like, it was playing game one night, and I said, hey, I'm going to start a company and make these uh, Starship deck plans. Uh, who's got 300 bucks? And Ross raised his hand and was my partner for the next 20 years. <laughs> He's right over there. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, oh, no, that's not Ross. OK, it just looks like Ross. <laughs> it looks like Ross. Anyway. Um, the lights yeah. are very bright. Yeah, it's the lights in the eyes. Um, but yeah, so we, you know, we became partners for 20 years for $300 investment. Um, so, but then that one built up uh, and then uh, became successful enough that we could start to invest in virtual world, um, which of course was a fallacy because we, it cost so much more to build that than we thought it was going to, that we, we really drove fast into very tough financial times. And mm -hmm. my father's fi fiscal management and you know playing three card Monty with like every manufacturer and <laughs> distributor necessary to keep us alive um, was was critical. I mean, we, we had really played our string out to the end. And, um, and luckily, the, the Disney family um, really became very interested in what we were doing there and came in and bought uh, the majority of a virtual world from us. And that that kind of saved the day. Yeah. So um, and, and, and each one kind of builds on the next, you know, um, so uh, but actually getting outside money to do brand new things is really hard and happens very rare. Yeah. Um, most of the time you, you have to figure out how to pony up yourself because most investment is very backward looking. It's like, oh, that's been successful. We'll invest for it to try to be successful again. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, so that could bring us to some Kickstarter talk because uh, that kind of changed things up for a lot of people. Um, uh, and you guys uh, were able to do uh, uh, some, some good um, crowdfunding and, and make that work for your business model. I, I think crowdfunding days. is indeed a, uh, a game changer. Uh, sorry about the pun, but it is indeed um, because as backward looking as um, kind of investment communities tend to be, uh, fans and players are very forward looking, right? Um, they, 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 they want what's coming next you know they want to boy don't they <laughs> <laughs> hey, this uh, new book has been out 10 minutes when's the next one out <laughs> that's very true <laughs> uh and yeah so at um at hbs uh originally when you know mitch and my partner and i were you know um 
we were building, we were a small team, we were building mobile games, and uh, you know, both of us were backing kind of artists on Kickstarter because it was such a wonderful platform to do that. And he said, well, hey, we should, we should fund a game on here. And I'm like, I don't think that's gonna work. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, why would, it's about funding unknown artists, not about like giving money to old guys <laughs> who've made games before, you <laughs> right? know? Um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, the uh, uh, Double Fine came out and did a really, really big one. And I turned to Mitch and said, well, yeah, I'm, I was wrong, you know? Uh, so we decided we'll do it for, for Shadowrun. And the fans just overwhelmed us. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of not, you know, not only their financial support, but also their emotional support, which is something that doesn't get talked about as much on yeah. Kickstarter, that to us has been so important. Um, that connection with the audience, that support through, you know, making anything is hard. And if they're there, you know, supporting you uh, throughout that, it really makes it a better game, you know, and, and the ability to have those conversations have been, been fantastic. So yeah, we, we did four of them uh, at, at um, Hairbrain Schemes, and they were all trying but wonderful experiences. <laughs> As it always is. Um, so it, it occurs to me that you have a really good perspective as well on um, starting something with a vision of it being one way and um, having to zigzag and take a little bit of an indirect path to to get somewhere finding finding out that um, you know, or, or convincing people that the idea was right, or admitting that the idea, or that you were wrong, that the about the idea. Um, I'm thinking of specifically whiz kids in this case, um, because I, uh, my husband is a rabid uh, metal miniatures collector, and uh, and when we talked it over, we thought it was crazy talk. We thought. The, the collectible pre-painted miniatures that you, you couldn't see what you're buying you're getting a random pack just sounded like the most insane thing. Why would anyone do that? Oh, look at the huge success that was. So wrong. Really missed the boat. Really didn't understand. Um, what are uh, a couple of your projects that you were on that side of? You, you must have had a few. Well, I mean, that, that's uh, an interesting one to talk about because I, um, uh, in terms of like how I arrived at that, right? Um, my my two older sons uh, were I think ten and eight at the time, and they had uh, really wanted to play miniature games. Right, they, and the only kind of game in town was the you know Warhammer Warhammer Forty K stuff, and they were they really wanted to play those and saved up all their money, and then we bought them, and of course they couldn't play it, and they couldn't assemble or paint the figures. You know, not like their imagination because yes. you know you're. Yeah. Your you know fine motor control at eight and ten is not going to produce the figure that that's in the pictures in the books. Oh, definitely you know? not. Those professional painters are yeah mad. amazing, right? And so it was a very disappointing experience for them. Yeah. And I realized, okay, our industry has unintentionally created all these barriers to entry to new players and to young players by you know by all of this complexity and all of this preparation um, uh, necessary to play the game. So. Um, Sometimes I refer to this as forming the box when I, in my thought process, which is um, a lot of people say, oh, think outside the box. Well, to me, it's like, you know, create a box that is the constraints of the problem you're trying to solve, right? Um, so that you'll know when an idea is actually a good idea because it will have met these criteria, yes. right? Because otherwise you can just be coming up with ideas all day long. And so for this one, it was like, okay, well, you know, the constraints were, uh, we need something that's inexpensive, um, that uh, comes assembled, that gets rid of the big tables and charts and, and all that kind of stuff for, and record keeping and all those kind of things, transportable. And, th and that was all from the player's perspective. From the uh, retailer's perspective, miniature games are very, very difficult to shelve because they take up so much space and the turn per, per skew is yeah. low. So I wanted to, how do I solve that for a retailer? Okay, well, if it's a, if it's a, cl a blind collectible, then it takes up like magic, it takes up much less shelf space um, and you can turn the SKUs much faster. So that's a good thing from a retailer's point of view. And then it was, how do I solve that from a manufacturing point of view? Because, um, you know, plastic molds are very expensive. They are, yeah. Right, and so then the, it became, well, if the, the combat dial solution allows me to differentiate figures that are physically the same and then paint allows me to differentiate them, then I can amortize those molds, right? So I had to kind of solve on all four sides of the box and that would then tell me if the solutions were good. And so when I, right. when I arrived at one, I took it to uh, my partners at FASA and said, I think we should do this, right? 
Um, and they, like you, <laughs> said, that's a really dumb idea. <laughs> and it's way too risky because um, it was a very big investment yeah, yeah. to do, to do all the, all the sculpting and the tooling and everything. Um, so instead, I, I went out and raised uh, some you know, friends and family funds uh, and, uh, and we started it as a separate company. Yeah. That's a, that's a pattern with you. <laughs> so that's a pattern with you. <laughs> So, yeah. so in being some stubborn, ways, yeah. yeah. In some yeah. ways, you're like, all right. Uh, once again, who wants to be my partner? This time it's thirty thousand dollars, whatever it is. Severely underestimating. Um, I've kind of run out of steam for a second oh. um, because we were. Well, I'm, actually, let's continue the Whiskits conversation for a second. Okay. There was another interesting kind of thing I learned there. Um, uh, we had done the uh, Mage Knight and then Heroclex and Battle uh, uh, Mech Warrior Dark Age, and they were all based on the same uh, combat dial mechanic. Um, and we had then been acquired by Tops, right? Um, and I wanted to do a game that leveraged Tops distribution system mm -hmm. because, and mass distribution, the games are shelved kind of back in the game section, right? But Tops had this incredibly valuable real estate right at checkout. But we couldn't get our games shelved there because our, they were too big, right? Um, and uh, and so I was like, okay, can we create a game that all fits in the foil pack up front, right? Um, and so the whole game is, you know, any pack is a starter set. Uh, so I worked with the team, and, uh, a small team, and we came up with uh, a concept for what became uh, Pirates of the Spanish Main. But what was interesting to me is that to a person, all the senior staff at WizKids was very against the idea. Um, they were very afraid of it, right? Um, and these are people who had left secure jobs to join an unproven startup, right? So financially, they had taken a big risk to start this company. Mm -hmm. But now we were, you know, very comfortable that for this whole product line failed, it would have been, you know, it would not have been a big deal financially, yeah. right? But they were scared of it. And I'm like, why is this the case? What's, what's going on? And then I started to realize it had nothing to do with finance. Right, it had to do with uh, prat falling in public. Yes. Right. If the first product had failed, no one would have noticed because first-time products fail all the time. But if you fail on the fourth product after the first three are big successes, yeah, everybody is going to notice. Right. And it was that fear of failing in public that was that was really, you know, making people much more conservative. And I started to realize that that's not. That all of a sudden explained to me a lot of why why startups innovate and big companies don't, right? Um, because they, it's not just financial. It, it, the financial ramifications are small, but there's the emotional ramifications of failing in a public forum that really tends to you know stifle innovation. Uh, and it's it's a really hard one to get around. I don't it's have a, the secret sauce on how to get around it. It's a really good point, though, because especially. Um, especially how uh, connected we are, like you get that feedback right away. Ah, you haven't even had a chance to sit down and figure out what happened and there's somebody commenting on it, you know? It's, it's very quick. It's, it's not like the old days where they had to like sit down and take out a pen and paper and write you a letter to tell you that they saw you fall down. Um, no, I think that, that's true. I mean, our connection with the audience uh, is so much more prevalent than it used to be, right? I mean, it used to be for, for years of my career, the only time you would really get kind of immediate interaction with, with the audience was at conventions, which is one of the reasons conventions were so wonderful, right? Um, but now there is, it is a constant 24-7 conversation uh, with, the, with the players, which is wonderful, but also you know, takes a lot of time and energy to manage yeah. um, and to keep, uh, to keep positive and, and to keep respectful, right? Um, because, you know, uh, the reason we're we're respectful in cons is because we're in person, yeah. and all of our social norms keep us in a more you know constructive, respectful uh, footing. Yeah, um, that doesn't translate often to the internet, and so it is more of a challenge to do yeah. that. I appreciate your positivity because I I am definitely, in addition to being stubborn and doing it myself, I'm also a fighter. So, so <laughs> like, oh, this guy wants to throw down, eh? Yeah, you know, I, I get suckered into that stuff all the time because I'm, uh, you know, I'm passionate about what I do, and uh, and so I can completely see that reality in me that you just mentioned that that fear of 
do we take on this project and, and have it publicly fail after people are looking at us? So that's, um, that is a challenge. I don't know, I don't have an answer, but you seem to be you're doing pretty well. I'll just follow your lead. Well, yeah, and you know, I mean, uh, again, we talk about the ones that are succeed. Like in in Peter's list, he didn't mention Smith and Tinker. Yes. Right? So Smith and Tinker was a, a company that was in between those <laughs> that wasn't mentioned. Um, but you know, we that was actually my the the company I raised the most outside money. We raised like twenty three million dollars uh, to to build this uh, this big kids platform game, uh, and then launched it on Christmas two thousand eight which is the one, you know, the Grinch stole. There yeah. was the Christmas 2008. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we dove, I mean, just there was whoosh, bam, down. Um, and that's what happens, you know, you gotta pick yourself up at that. But a lot of the, you know, out of that ashes came Hairbrain Schemes, because a lot of the team, uh, the, you know, the core team initially came over, we started Hairbrain Schemes, and then as it grew, more of the team joined us. Um, and so it, you know, everything is a, everything's a cycle of rebirth. See, that's a really good positive attitude. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, when we were talking about what we might discuss here, uh, when we talked about, uh, you, you said specifically that you would like to talk about Smith & Tinker, which is uh, it, it's a brave stance and a, an important thing to touch on that a lot of people would not. They would take that opportunity to, you know, downplay that, that uh, failure, that public well, I mean, failure. I think it's it's an important part of the story, right? I mean, because and it's not the only one that failed; it was just the biggest one. <laughs> um, but I, I think you know, if I'm, I want to encourage people to try new ideas, to make new games, and to and to build companies, you know, where appropriate to do that. And uh, and so the idea and the knowledge that they don't always work uh, is important, right? And because you don't want to think, oh, I'm the only one that ever failed. No, no, we all <laughs> fail, right? And fail, you know. Failure is indeed absolutely part of the part of that process. So um, we were talking before we came on stage about our kids and their futures and um, where they are on their path, um, since they're all around the same age. And um, uh, that got me thinking: what do you what do you see the creative space being like for the the generation that is behind us with our kids? Yeah, I was uh, our kids being you know fully formed adults in yeah, their twenties exactly. and thirties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, two of my boys, uh, Zach and Nate, are, are uh, d game designers. Uh, Zach is uh, uh, head of development and uh, uh, at Calliope Games, where they do tons of boards and card games, which are some really good ones. And then uh, Nate is a partner in Monocle Society, which is doing uh, augmented reality uh, tabletop mm -hmm. games. And uh, uh, super proud of both of them, and uh, and also think that their lives are going to be harder than mine. Uh, uh, you know when. Uh, I got into the industry, not only were production values lower so that the investment required to get in was, but also there was very few people involved in speculative fiction, mm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, you know, it was a niche genre of publishing and that was it. Um, and, you know, and, and, some, and obviously some comics, but, but now popular culture is dominated by speculative fiction, right? Every, almost every television show and movie, uh, YA novel series, you know, uh, on and on, and, uh, and, and, and so much more product, right? So many more TV shows, so many more movies, so many more games being made. Um, it is much more difficult to find that kind of blue ocean space. I mean, like when I started, you know, cyberpunk meets fantasy, okay. Those are two big concepts I could peanut butter and jelly together. Yeah. You can't do that now, yeah. they're all gone. Right, all that big stuff, and so it's much harder to kind of find and and you know find the space to to create something new um, that that differentiates itself, and it's and it's and it has to be done more in the subtlety and in the quality of execution because there's so much you know out there and everything in, in fiction and in games, um, and so it's it's uh, at one point on one hand it's like absolutely a renaissance, right? more people playing games than ever you know, in the history of mankind, which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And it's also a very difficult time because more people are making games and making speculative fiction than ever in the history of mankind. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you see um, the augmented reality stuff kind of uh, taking over um, in the tabletop space? Would you, would you give us a prediction? Uh, oh, for augmented reality stuff? Yeah. Um, I, 
I do think that uh, we will find uh, more and more uses for it, right? Um, to me, the, the, fundamental, the fundamental benefit of a tabletop game is not what's on the table, it's who's sitting at the table, right? It is about the human connection and the socialization, right? And so any tech, you know, technology that starts to remove that is not gonna be a benefit to a tabletop kind of experience, right? It's gonna be, well, we might as well be sitting in my den and you're sitting in yours, we'll play online. Yeah. Which we can have great experiences doing that, but it's different, it's different than the magic that happens at the table. Um, but there is a lot of uh, drudgery <laughs> That is part of some games, uh, part of some gameplay, which can be, you know, I think. Augmented. I backed Golem because I wanted that tech, not necessarily for what you were using it for. <laughs> well, I, mean, I appreciate it was, that. It was a perfectly fine, that. fun game, but uh, but I could see the potential there, like like the the removal of having to keep track of yeah. all of the the rules in your head for the special it, it, corner. It's an case extension or, of what we did at WizKids, right? It's it's yeah. a matter of well, okay, we, if we can get rid of the rule book and put it on the figure itself, that's yeah. a step in the right direction. Um, and so I think, and I look at some of the stuff that Nate and Kyle and, and, and Ryan and are doing there and, and others in the field, and it's, I think there's some super exciting stuff there. And I think um, uh, with, uh, real opportunities in collaborative gaming, real opportunities in, in socializing in different ways and overlay of information. Um, having been involved in VR since Jaron Lanier, you know, yeah. <laughs> started to do it, and uh, we would hang out dreadlocks and all, um, uh, to, to now, I've always, believe that VR uh, ultimately will be a smaller uh, impact on the world than augmented reality. Because uh, if we look at all of our techs so far, like technology um, that uh, kind of cocoons us has never been as prevalent as technology that enhances the world around us, yeah. right? We, when the web came out, everybody's like, what's the killer app for the web? And we were all making all sorts of crazy stuff. And the killer app for the web was, how to get a better pizza faster, right? <laughs> um, and you know, or order a book. I mean, it was about how to use it as a tool to enhance the rest of your life. And same is true as we look at our phones, right? Yeah, we're playing lots of cool games on our phones, but a lot of what our phone does is en enhance our social and our physical world. Uh, and I think AR has that opportunity in a much broader sense uh, than VR. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's um, well, it's exciting for me. Uh, I am getting the wrap it up sign, which is handy since I was out of questions, and I can now turn it to Peter for some audience questions. Well, first of all, thank you. That was uh, that was great. I, uh, I'm very inspired. <laughs> but Jordan, you've been inspiring me for years, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, okay, so we have a, a couple of audience questions uh, from Shannon. You have a career spanning several gaming areas, role-playing games, computer games, what is your key advice for others who may want to bridge areas and sectors in a similar fashion? Um, well, good question. I think, uh, I guess for me, do one well before doing the next. Um, uh, because building success and building confidence in, in one genre is going to give you access to um, uh, additional genres. And you'll just be able to start to broaden out. Uh, I think if you kind of, you know, kind of, if you're, uh, you know what? What's the old one of the? You can do everything, but you're master of none. Um, it's a it's a more difficult space to, uh, to work in. So I think pick pick the one where. Um, to me, the the kind of way I always look at it is, what can I do if no one else helps me, right? Um, because when you're starting, no one else is going to help you, and so uh, you know that for me was typically tabletop, right? I could, I could actually make a tabletop game without having to have tons of expensive programmers and artists and, and other, other things around. So, uh, you know, do that, invest your passion in it, make something great, and then that's your doorway to the, to the, next, uh, to the next genre. Great. Um, uh, so this next question was, uh, um, somebody must have known what you were talking about a little bit or saw Nicole's questions, because um, you talked a lot about failure and this question was, what did you learn from your biggest failure? Um, uh, well, each failure teaches you something different. <laughs> um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, failures we didn't talk about was a, um, a game uh, called Arcane Legions, um, which was uh, something that we started a company called Wells Expeditions to do. And uh, Arcane Legions was, um, a, uh, it was a mass action system uh, that I really loved. <laughs> I still love that system. But um, uh, 
we released the game and it had a combination of, of uh, pre-painted and unpainted and collectible and not collectible and uh, it just just didn't go anywhere it was a, and it was a very expensive game to create and so it was a huge loss um, and my takeaway from that is this was the third game company I was starting right I'd done FASA I'd done WizKids and I, I figured I got this nailed I know what I'm doing you know never if you said that you just you've already lost <laughs> right <laughs> um, just because you've done it twice successfully before doesn't mean that you understand what the hell you're doing you know I didn't do the research I didn't really check what today's market was like what was going on at retailers what players were you know uh, reacting well to I didn't do my homework because of my arrogance assuming I knew what I was doing uh, and uh, you know failure will slap you up the head, side of the head and remind you that yeah, right good um, okay, so next question. Uh, when writing the Battletech game, were there any systems or rules that you thought too complex or not suitable for the setting? Uh, for the computer game, or is it, or for the original I don't Battletech know. game? I don't know. <laughs> it, um, <laughs> so, uh, when you're a young designer, um, <laughs> there is nothing that's such as too complex because the more complex you make the game, the smarter you've told everybody you are. When you're an older designer, you realize that's ass backwards. <laughs> um, that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, the truly great games are the ones that are completely elegant, that the rules um, aren't trying to convince you how, how complex or sophisticated they are, but they just get the hell out of the way and you enjoy a great game. So um, the original Battletech game uh, was a young Jordan design. <laughs> it, had, it had all sorts of interesting complexity. Now, what was interesting is as of the time it was released, it was not considered a complex game. and I. It was considered kind of a, a, a mid-tier game at the time, but by today's standards, it's, you know, way up there. And then, of course, when you add 35 years of additional supplements on top of it, uh, it's a super complex game. We uh, had that challenge when translating that to the, to the computer game over the last couple of years as we were trying to think about how do we make that uh, accessible to the modern kind of computer tactical game playing audience um, and keep uh, the essence of the game there, keep the the tactics the same and the kind of recognition of what these mechs are and how they work, but, but try to create game systems that are more accessible. And that was our biggest risk in the project was, was how to do that in a way that the fans of the existing tabletop game felt was respectful of their experience of the game, of the original game, and yet make it accessible to new players. And that was the type rope we were trying to walk. Good. Uh, another Battletech question for you. So what most excites you about the future of Battletech? Um, well, we're super excited about, on a personal level, um, the game we're, you know, the game we just made, uh, and the way that today's world means that we can keep making that game. Right? It used to be that you'd make a game, you put in a on a on a disc, or when I first started on cassette tapes. I mean, you know, uh, and you'd send it out, and you were done, right? And then three years later, you get to make another one. Um, uh, what I do like about today is that we, you know, we're constantly releasing updates, and we're constantly able to make the game better. Um, and so this becomes much more like episodic storytelling, which is something Battletech was always about, right? Uh, I mean, that's why we did all the novels and we tied the novels into the games so we tied the, and into the video games and we treated it as one large episodic story. Um, and the, uh, the ability to do that now in the computer game is something I'm, I'm super excited about. Great. We're gonna love this next one. I get asked a similar about it. So, <laughs> whatever happened to Earth Dawn? <laughs> are, there, are there any plans to bring it back, like Shadowrun Returns or Battletech? Um, so, uh, Earth Dawn was a, an RPG uh, that was kind of a high fantasy RPG uh, set uh, kind of uh, unacknowledgedly in the Shadowrun timeline um, in, the, in a previous era of high magic in Shadowrun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was good. It was subtle. We tried to, you know, weave it in there. Um, uh, we, there aren't any current uh, plans for a computer game version of it, but I believe that Ross, my partner in FASA, is working on a new tabletop version of oh. Earth Dawn. Um, and I hope that's public knowledge because I just said it. But um, You heard it first at Gen Con. <laughs> it's out. All right. Yay. There, it's out. So that's great. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's out. It's here. Go get it. All right. Great. Um, well, I have a, I'm going to have a couple questions that I'm going to throw in since we've accomplished all of our audience questions. Thank you. Um, so you um, uh, you were talking about that moment in developing um, the, the Spanish Bane about your staff, like nobody wanting to go, nobody, nobody thinking that we were going in the right direction, and you, you were having this vision. Um, 
Is there, can you comment on this friction? Because I, I say it as an entrepreneur and I'm always wondering what, um, you know, how, when's that, tr how's the trick? How do you know like, oh, this is the time I really should listen to my staff and like, nope, this is the time when they're all wrong and I'm right. <laughs> do, do you ever have that quadri? Oh yeah, uh, constantly. Uh, constantly, constantly. Uh, and I felt you know, and, and many of the of the team eventually came around, and, and obviously part of my the, the like Mike and and members of the little dev team, they were very enthusiastic, but uh, uh, but people less close to the product were were the ones more scared of it. Um, uh, it is a matter of um, uh, you can never reach consensus, right? Um, and that's not true. Often you can reach consensus. You, you shouldn't feel if restricted. Got, it was yeah. boring if you got to consensus. Yeah, you can't. Probably. Yeah, you shouldn't feel restricted if you don't reach consensus. When I started working with uh, my wife Dawn and I, we've worked together at several of these companies, and she was the art director at FASA. Um, uh, excuse me, at uh, WizKids, and um, uh, that was the first time we had kind of worked in the office together because in like virtual world, she was doing all the interior decoration, but that was different than me doing the software, you know, um, and. One after kind of like our first month in the office, she said, "I wonder why we have meetings sometimes because you go into the meeting knowing what the answer is, and we spend an hour with the team, and then we come to that answer, right? And we go, why didn't you just tell them what you what the answer was, what you wanted?" I was like, "Well, because one, I'm not sure if we as we discuss it, if I'll stick with that answer." because often that answer will change based upon the good input that you're getting from the team. But even in the rare case where it does stay to be the same answer I entered with, now it's something that we've arrived at collectively so that everybody can embrace it more and work on it together, right? Rather than just being told, go this direction, you know? And, uh, and so it is, it is about trying to reach uh, at least creative buy-in for people yeah. who have to really, you know, uh, you know contribute, cre contribute creatively to an idea. Okay, one last last question. First of all, uh, you're still um, actively involved in working with a lot of the professional investment community, I assume, like uh, venture capitalists and and so on. Well, I haven't worked with VCs. Well, I guess that's not true. I was in a VC's office last week, so yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I have, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, in the last few years, even several conversations at this show about the so-called geek wave. You know, over the last. 10 years, we've seen it as Gen Con, as the attendance for our show just suddenly skyrocketed. And we, we see signs of this all over with um, various things like actual play and D&D having its best years and Magic's having. Um, do, the, do the VCs of the world, are they seeing this? Do they know, do you think that they are interested in what's happening in this space? And if so, what are they looking for? Well, venture capitalists are, um are uh, a strange animal um, and it's an animal that moves on herd instinct you know um, <laughs> and so uh, it is difficult you have to kind of it's tough to get a VC you either get the herd <laughs> or you don't get any of them you know um, and uh, there are a couple things that are difficult uh, about their traditional way of thinking about things and there's always outliers right but um, one they really hate carbon right uh, physical things are, uh, are a challenge uh, for them because the scalability isn't anywhere near as quick as can happen in, uh, in digital. Like um, when we were doing Golem Arcana uh, and, you know, uh, and we were selling Shadowrun, and my CFO would regularly call me up and go, hey, you know, last weekend we sold 10,000 more copies of Shadowrun than we thought we were going to. Can we do that on Golem Arcana? Uh, no, we would have had to order that inventory seven months ago, right? And so that, that is, it is a tougher challenge, right? And it's more uh, capital, you have to have more capital tied up in your whole pipeline and inventory and everything else. So they're very resident about uh, car carbon in general. And then they have, uh, what I love is they always view games as hit driven, right? And that's, they don't like to invest in hit driven things without recognizing that everything is hit driven. I mean, it's like, <laughs> You know, how many social platforms were there before one became the winner? How many e-commerce platforms were there before one became the winner, right? It, it, all industries kind of are hit driven, um, and especially in the kind of uh, social and, and app world that we're in. Um, so I, I, I always view that as kind of a false argument, but it's one they, they stick to a lot. And, and content 
driven is another thing they don't love, right? They love platforms more than content, right? Like for for um, Smith and Tinker, um, the the whole pitch there was that the first game was just a demonstration of the platform, but the platform is what they were investing in, right? Um, and because they wouldn't, they didn't, no, it wouldn't raise that much money to invest in a game. You know? So it is, it is tough. Now that said, VCs are also kind of becoming. Uh, the, the space they operate in is becoming weird, right? It used to be that they would, um, a VC would invest on a business plan, right? Now they invest um, after momentum is demonstrated, right? Because so they expect the founders to have already demonstrated that the idea is working before they invest it. Now that used to be called growth capital. So if VCs aren't, you know, if the VCs are now kind of like lower end growth capital um, than really being VCs in many cases, right? Uh, and the, the kind of true VCs are become are, are like always the founders or crowdfunding, right? Is where ideas get born um, now, and so it's it, the the whole kind of funding landscape is definitely shifting. Right. Great. Well, that's all our questions. You guys did fantastic. Thank you so much. Let's give a warm round of applause. Thank you for having us, Peter. Absolutely. I got to say, these are two of my favorite people to talk to in our industry. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.